Hi, I'm Mike Bartrop, and I'm going to talk to you about universal design for learning in the classroom. You can find me at whatbinder.com. Once again, I'm Michael Bartrop, and with the belief that universal design for learning will save us all, I co-started the hashtag TDSBUDL initiative to enhance classrooms across the city, the province, and the world. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Bartrop, or again at whatbinder.com. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, what is universal design? Well, it's a concept that started in the architectural community. What you're looking at in front of me is something that you may have seen in science fiction movies, political thrillers, or any number of superhero features. This is, of course, the Lincoln Memorial. We're going to take a look at this because with universal design, we look at what are some of the barriers to entry. When we take a look at this, we may realize that getting there may be a concern. Having the money to get there may be a concern, but even if you've made it all the way so that you're looking at this very view, you may find another stumbling block, and it could be those stairs. Those stairs right now will impede people from accessing the building, which means it is not created with a universal design concept. What could we do? Well, after the fact, we could add an elevator, but we'd have to probably put it around back. We could add some ramps, but we would have to stick them on to the sides because so much of this building has been designed with an aesthetic in mind. However, when something is created with a universal design mindset, it is not simply an afterthought. It is in the design from the very beginning. So rather than making people feel like they had to be accommodated later on, they knew that they were accommodated during the creation phase. So universal design for learning pre-accommodates the needs of your learners in the classroom. What is universal design for learning? What does that look like in a classroom? Well, classroom design, lesson delivery, assignment design, and assessment and evaluation are all key factors of universal design for learning. Now, when a student looks at our classroom, they are looking at a reflection of our teaching, our values, and our ideals. I want you to take a moment and think, do you agree with that or is that just something I've made up? And if you do agree with it, what does that mean to you? Well, I'm going to tell you, this is one of the first things that students see when they walk into a classroom, a cork board. Some are completely bare with nothing on them. Others have been brightly painted and covered with all sorts of things that let students know that they are welcomed and valued. Some examples might be student work. A number of different posters could be put up that students have created, but you can even put some written assignments up there. And if you come into this knowing that student work should be posted in the classroom, students will know that their work is valued and they'll want to put their best efforts forward. Anchor charts are key. Having pieces around the classroom that students can look at when they would otherwise just be daydreaming is very important. Anchor charts are great for passive learning. There are times when all of us get a little bit bored when we are listening to somebody speak. You may experience this during this video. You start looking around, looking at your phone if you have nothing else, but if there are brightly colored anchor chart posters around the classroom, those may draw the eye as well. And instead of seeing what the latest uh, update on their social media is, they could be taking in and passively learning about literacy skills, numeracy concepts, or all sorts of other pieces. And finally, the lesson goals. You want to make sure that your lesson goals are proudly displayed in the classroom so that students know what they are doing isn't for no reason at all. There is a plan in mind. Because when students understand that the teacher knows what they're doing and isn't just making it up on the spot, they're far more likely to engage with that learning activity. Now let's talk about classroom layout. We want to make sure that there's an ease of mobility we need to make sure that there's an ease of communication between us and our students, and there needs to be an ease of focus, that attention can be drawn to a central spot when needed. And of course, ease of access. All of our students must be able to get around the class, and even if new students are added later in the year, we should make sure that they are easily accommodated and that changes don't need to be made midstream. It's also important to recognize that part of the classroom is also our virtual learning space. 
There are a lot of learning systems like Google Classroom out there. And we need to try to make sure that they are also accommodating. We can chunk these digital spaces by using meaningful headings. We can use visual cues like emojis in those headings. And we can create a thoughtful use of tools by using assignments when necessary and the material function when you don't need to actually submit anything. By understanding our virtual learning space, we can make sure that our students have a better time accessing it and learning from it as well. And remember, these spaces can be used not only to distribute materials, but also for submission purposes. Now, the way we present information is as important as the information we present. I'd invite you to pause here for a moment and consider what that means to you. We're going to go forward and think that there are a number of ways that we present information to our students. Sometimes it's just by standing there talking at them. This is not always the most ideal way to communicate. In fact, this is rarely the most ideal way to communicate. But for a number of us, the lecture style classroom is what we grew up with, so it's hard to break away from that. But there are some other options. You can also use very well created handouts. Infographics are important as well. There's a place for videos to be used in your classroom, but make sure that you turn on the captions, once again, creating a universal design mindset. And no matter what you are using, we should be making sure that our students are annotating everything that they do. Because making those notes, creating those annotations, is not only a lifelong literacy skill, it's also something that's going to help them remember and easily focus their thoughts when they need to come back for an assessment or evaluation. So once again, it's not about using any one method, it's about figuring out how to combine all of these methods into your daily practice. That way, no matter what your style is, students will be able to access the information. Now let's take a look at a classroom. This is what a lot of classrooms look like. The teacher at the front, the students in rows. But we know that this is not the most ideal way of learning. This is a forward-facing classroom where the teacher is the one in charge. It's always easy to spot who is in charge by understanding the main focal point. If all desks are pointed one way, you are sending a message. And this is not the universal design message we want to be sending. We should be considering making the students larger, the students more in charge, them being able to partner with each other and learn from each other's experiences, while the teacher is still able to hold a focal point while needed, but not being the main focus in the room. Through this, students are able to learn from each other and know that their voices are valued constantly. This also creates space in the classroom for mobility, for students to get up and walk around if needed, and for teachers to walk around and make sure that they can interact one-on-one -on -one with each and every student in a pleasant way. Now, students should be challenged, but they shouldn't have to struggle to understand expectations. This is something that a lot of people can find confusing. We know that students need to be challenged, but if they can't understand what that challenge is, they're more likely to ignore it completely. It's our responsibility to make sure that our instructions are clear to them and that they can focus on the learning and the expression of their learning. So here's a poster. This poster is not created with universal design thinking in mind. At the top it says, Teachers Union Leave and Programming Committee. That's underlined. It's bold. It's in caps. It would make you think that that's important, but is it? Is this a poster for a Teachers Union League Leave and Programming Committee? Oh, no, no, no. It's the Pregnancy, Parental, Surrogacy, and Adoption Leave Workshop to be held on. So that is the real focus, but it's down in the middle and off to the side. Then we have a box, which is good. It's good to have a box. We have a date there, but is that all the information that I need? So I know what date it is, but is that going to help me get there? Oh, okay, below that is some of the information telling me where I need to go. And then, of course, there's that line at the bottom that seems tacked on, 
but this is actually how you register. So if you don't get that piece of information, you're probably not going to be invited inside. Also, it's lime green. Does lime green have anything to do with that committee's color scheme? In this case, I can tell you it does not. So let's take a look at how we could take all the information here and reframe it with a universal design for learning mindset. Here's a poster for you. The important information is large and centered. You can see that very clearly when your eyes go to this, this is the Pregnancy, Parental, Surrogacy, and Adoption Leave Workshop. All the meeting details are collected in that central box. It's got the date, it's got the time, it has the address. And the visuals are also there, but they're not confusing, they don't seem tacked on, they seem very pleasant and inviting. And finally, the registration information is still at the bottom, but it's now larger and it's centered. And because you are now made to read from a top to bottom perspective without missing anything, that information will be clearly understood by everyone who takes a look at this poster. And the color scheme matches the color scheme of the organization. So when we take a look at these two pieces, we can see that we haven't changed any of the information. Everything is still the same. The only thing that's different is the layout. And that is exactly what we do in our classroom with our own handouts to make sure that students have an easier time accessing the information. Here is an assignment. It's an essay assignment, uh, a literacy circle essay assignment. And you can see this and already think, well, this isn't that bad. It's chunked. I can see thesis, thesis example, essay topics, all that stuff is there. What could possibly be done better? But then I show you this and you think, oh, there's some bullet points, there's some bold text, there's some italics. Well, it can't possibly get any better than this, can it? But I would say yes, it still can. Here is that exact same assignment sheet with the exact same information but it's a lot more easy to understand. We can see that our headings are being used and clearly defined. We have a large title and subtitle. When students are flipping through their notes, they will find this instantly. If they have a number of loose leaf sheets on their desk, it's easy to draw attention to this. Students will see the introduction, they will see that there's a section for planning, the essay themes are numbered, and at the very bottom, that, exam that piece is in a box. So all of a sudden, students know that additional information might be in boxes that look like this. And if you use this same style with all of your handouts, students will get to learn your style of handout creating so they won't struggle with where to look. They will instantly know where to look on each paper. Again, we have that descriptive title, the headings, the subtitle. We're using Arial size 12 font to make sure it's accessible for most learners. A lot of teachers think that they can't fit enough information on if they're using size 12 font, but the key thing there is, if you need more information, maybe you need more pages. And if you don't want more pages, maybe you don't need all that information. Just as we expect our students to edit their work to only have the important features, so too should they expect us to do the same for assignments and those supplemental details in the boxes. Now, as I said, if you format all of your assignments the same, students will know that an assignment overview is at the top. If they want the quick facts, they can go there. If they need more information, they can look at the accessible lists. And then, of course, the further details can be found in other sections. What's important is that our assignments are predictable for students so that they never have to struggle with where to look. And this makes it easy for you because when students say, I don't understand this piece, they will say, I don't understand the piece under the essay theme heading. If you would like to learn how to enhance your handouts with headings, you can take a look at the four part series, which you can find in this actual slide deck linked in the description below, or by searching on YouTube, Google Docs, how to use headings. So perfecting your handouts with universal design for learning. We want to reduce the number of tasks. We want to include effective exemplars so that students can see what it is they need to create. Add completion checklists to make it easy for students to stay on top of their own work. 
design graphic organizers that once again help them organize their own thoughts and ideas. And we want to provide hard and soft copies to make sure that even if they lose the one in their binder, they still have access to the assignments in a virtual space that they can access from any location. This assignment was created by Nadine Hart and it shows a number of those pieces. We can see that there's a straightforward expectation right there at the top. All of the key information that students need to succeed is at the beginning. So if they only read one or two paragraphs, they're going to be able to complete this project. And there is an exemplar of the final copy. If students wonder what their poster should look like, they don't need to just rely on talking to friends trying to puzzle it out because you've given them that exemplar of what a perfect poster, perfect assignment would appear like. Students should never have to struggle to wonder what perfection looks like. Then there's an additional page with all of the examples of what they need to write. And then we have a graphic organizer which includes some checklists and spaces to write notes, draw notes, and again bulleted lists to make sure that everything is as clear as can be. When you are creating assignments like this, students will have a much easier time understanding what they're doing so they can focus on demonstrating their learning to you leaving you with much higher quality and more reflective examples of their abilities. And of course, you can always use additional graphic organizers when required. These are pieces that students can use to help themselves if they feel that it would be advantageous. Now we get to the part where we think that marks shouldn't reflect who students were, they should reflect who they are today, right now. I'd ask you to pause and consider if that's accurate in the marks that you leave with students. All right. So let's continue. Students need to have transparency when it comes to their marks. They must be aware of how they will be assessed. They must know what expectations from curricular documents are being targeted. They must understand what perfection looks like and they must feel that they are safe to take risks and they must have opportunities to redemonstrate. So what does this all mean? This means that there shouldn't be an assignment early on in the year that's worth 10% of their final mark or even 5% or even 3% of their final mark because students should be able to redemonstrate those skills. If five months later, right before report cards are handed out, a student has perfected something they didn't do that well on at the beginning of the year, they shouldn't be penalized for what they did at the beginning of the year. They should be rewarded for having learned and mastered those skills. We need to make sure that we are being completely transparent in our marks because when students understand how they're being assessed and why they're being assessed, they will again feel a stronger connection to that assessment. There are three main types of assessments, for, as, and of, diagnostic, formative, and summative. What does that mean? What makes them different? Well, assessment for learning is used to prepare for that learning experience. It grants teachers an understanding of the individual current skill levels of their class and their individual students, so they can start tailoring their lessons as required to fill in those skills gaps or to start enriching as necessary. Assessment as learning demonstrates the student's learning and it allows the teacher to gauge the effectiveness of their teaching. Because if all of the students still haven't learned a skill when you feel that you've taught it, well, you can best bet it's not the student's fault. We just haven't taught it properly. And because we know that, we can go back, do a half lesson, another full lesson, whatever may be required to make sure we've brought all of the students up to where they need to be before we move on to our assessment and evaluation of learning, those summative pieces. These are completed after the learning has done. Students shouldn't get a project and still be trying to figure out and learn how to do it. They should be able to engage with it at the time because the learning has already been taken care of and it evaluates the student's ability to demonstrate curricular expectations. And that's a key thing to focus on. It demonstrates a student's ability to demonstrate curricular 
expectations. It's not just a mark out of 10 because that's a number that we thought would fit best into our marking scheme. So to recap, students must know the expectations. The expectations must be explicitly taught in class. There must be a clear connection between the expectations and the tasks. A rubric needs to be used to communicate those expectations clearly to students. An expectation should build upon the curriculum's specific expectations. That means you got to read the curriculum. A scary thought, I know, but one that is so helpful in our teaching practice. This is what a page of my curriculum looks like. When I'm designing an assessment, the first thing I look at is which specific expectations do I want to target? Once I've made those selections, I need to think of what will that look like for students? So I take a look at those expectations and I frame them as questions. Did you complete the pre-reading graphic organizer in order to read for meaning? And have you made inferences about how the protagonist and are those inferences supported by embedded quotations? Now that I have my two questions, I can turn this curriculum document into a rubric. Here are my levels demonstrating limited, some considerable, and a high degree of. This rubric clearly has a question that students can ask themselves and they can answer to see how they're doing. And it connects 100% to the specific expectations in the curriculum. So if students ask, why are we doing this? Or why does this matter? You can show them immediately that the curriculum says this is what we're supposed to be focusing on and this is where you can find it if you would like to look into it more on your own. By empowering your students to understand the curriculum, you are providing them with agency to make change and to be more intrinsic learners. Now, we're gonna take a moment to talk about project-based learning. Project-based learning is a key form in our educator toolbox. Project-based learning challenges students to take risks in a safe and comfortable environment. Once you've created your rubric, students may want to explore the learning through a puppet show, creating a podcast or a song, doing a written essay, working with an app, a painting, an infographic. That's really up to them. Now, you may hear all of those different ways to express ideas and think to yourself, how can I manage the class if students are all doing different things? Or is it possible to assess students if they show learning in different ways? Or even is it possible to mark a video presentation and a hand-drawn poster with the same rubric? And most important, will the students think that it's fair? Is it fair that one student created a poster and the other wrote an essay? Well, the answer of course is Yes, because we mark the specific expectations no matter how they are demonstrated. You can look for those expectations regardless of how students are displaying their learning. So by empowering students to display their learning in the way that best suits their needs, they are much able to connect with the material and to have a much deeper and enriching exploration of what you have taught them. There needs to be a high grade in students' minds, and a challenging project for them to be happy. But what's so rare is something that comes in between. But by creating project-based learning where students can re-demonstrate different abilities when they need to, they will know that they are not going to be punished if the one risk they took didn't pan out because they can try, try again. So here are some quick things to remember. You should be creating your final marks based on consistent and recent performance of student skills demonstration. Once again, what they did at the beginning of the year should not factor into their final mark if they are much stronger in those skill areas later on. In fact, you should be pleased to bring their mark up because it just demonstrates that you have done your job well. You don't need to mark everything. It's not necessary. You can give some feedback orally to students. 
You can have students give feedback to each other on their own work, but not everything needs to count for that mark because students are still learning. They need the descriptive feedback when they are learning, but they don't always need numbers on a page. In fact, the first time students demonstrate a new skill, I would recommend that you don't put numbers on a page because it can only lead to them feeling bad because they haven't demonstrated a skill that they haven't quite mastered yet and that can make them feel as if they may never get to that higher ability. But with your descriptive feedback, they will be stronger the next time when you do give them that numerical grade. And students will adapt to a lack of marks. This is something that a lot of teachers struggle with, but it happens, it's true. And some won't, but I mean, that's their choice. And some students will not engage no matter what you try. But here is one thing that has worked incredibly well for me when not marking an assignment. Stickers are your friend. If you put a sticker on student work when it's handed in on time, no matter what the quality is like, students will get that work in on time. And if we have students getting work in on time, it will increase the quality of their future work because they're getting it in on time, allowing the descriptive feedback to go out. So stickers, they are very much your friend. And if you look at some dollar stores, you will find 200 to 400 stickers for a dollar. At that price, I mean, it's worth it. Now, after seeing this, a lot of you might be thinking it's impossible, but I assure you, it's possible. If you have any questions or want to connect or look deeper into Universal Design for Learning, feel free to find me at whatfinder.com or engage with me on Twitter at Mr. Barltrop. I'm always excited to talk about education and pedagogy and, of course, Universal Design for Learning. And thanks to Slides Carnival for providing me with this excellent template for my recording.